What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Meta Basics. Um, we're going to start talking about management now, and this entire series is about management. But you know, before I thought, um, you know, I'll run through the management series. I wanted to teach you something very specific that a lot of the world is divided about, and I'm not sure why the world is divided about it or has differences in opinion about this because there's an enormous amount of evidence in favor of it. So in this episode, we're going to start with the evolutionary psychology and management course. And obviously, we're going to start with what evolution is and why it's an it's not just a theory anymore. It is a facet of life. So here we go. All right, so uh, let's get started. You see, evolution is a theory that explains how life on Earth has diversified into millions of different species. So we have different species that we look at and we know that, you know, there's some common species we come in contact with every day, right? We have common names for them like dog or cat or human. But in reality, all of those cats are differentiated into different species too. Many of the dogs and we know this, right? We know that a Labrador has a different name or a species name than maybe a Doberman, right? So uh, species is how we differentiate different organisms here on earth and evolution is a key principle of biology and it connects many facets of life. Now it works through a mechanism called natural selection. Natural selection means that the best adapted individuals survive and reproduce in any given environment and we learn what that is in a little bit. So what happens at the core of evolution is that we make imperfect copies of ourselves. Right. A long time ago, humans used to think that when we make children or when any animal makes children, they're perfect copies. But we know that that is not true. We make slightly imperfect copies of ourselves, whether it be a cow or, you know, whether it be a human being or whether it be a very, very uh, primitive species like a fish. Right. They all make slightly different copies of themselves. So we do this by duplicating our DNA. DNA is coded information that defines how to build you. So every cell in your body and every cell in a fish's body has something called DNA. So when any species gives birth, the DNA is replicated into the cells of the children, right? So, and it defines how to build you. So if you have somebody's DNA and if say in the future, we had the ability to project somebody's DNA and figure out what they would look like, we'd be able to do it, right? So the basis of evolution, and this is going to sound you know, really crazy is random mutation. So when this copying process happens, when DNA splits, there are errors during this process, right? And these happen randomly, right? It could happen in the presence of, of radiation. It could happen, you know, just randomly. It could happen because you were in the presence of carcinogens and a carcinogen, for example, smoking. It, all it does is speeds up the number of errors you pick up. Right. That's all it does. And, and we'll come to why that's important, why that causes cancer in a little bit. But for now, you just need to understand that errors can happen during copying. These happen randomly. And if the creature that has this mutation reproduces, it passes on this mutation. So let's assume that, you know, you are a random species. You're just a fish waddling around and you gave birth to another fish. And while you were giving birth to another fish, you know, a baby fish, um, what happened is because there was some UV light or some radiation and there's a lot of background amount of UV and radiation on the planet, um, your baby fish is slightly different. Maybe the pigment um, in its color or, or the pigment in its skin went from blue to slightly purple, right? And now when that fish reproduces, it's all its progeny is they're going to have the purple pigment, right? And this is a simplistic view, but and this is generally how it happens. That's one property that was passed on, which is the color, but there are many different properties that can be passed on, right? So you are a combination of your father and your mother. So 50% of DNA is from your father and 50% is from your mother. For example, a child can have long hair from the mother and tiny toes from the father, right? This is, it's, it happens all the time. And that's why, you know, when, when somebody comes in and they look at you and they say, Hey, you look a lot like your uncle, or you look a lot like your mom, or you look, you look a lot like your dad, right? Because we pass on our genes, but they're imperfect copies, which is why you don't look exactly like your dad. You look like a mixture of your dad and your mom, right? And that's with, when it comes to looks, there are a lot of things that you can't see. For example, your intelligence is also a combination. Your um, behavior is a combination. So a lot of different things are combinatorial from your parents. Right. So artificial selection and, you know, we we were 
you know, we, we, we had this idea and Charles Darwin came up with this idea of evolution. We said, hey, maybe there is natural selection, but a lot of us have been doing artificial selection for a long, long, long time. So what we did as human beings is we took gray wolves and we allowed them to breed. And every time the gray wolves gave birth to babies, we take the babies that were the most aggressive and just keep them away, prevent them from breeding, right? Whereas the most friendly babies, we'd allow them to continue breeding. And what started happening was the children started becoming tamer and tamer and tamer. And this gene for tameness, just like the gene, gene for looks was passed on or rather got selected for. We can use either word. So as you can see, the gray wolf is the common ancestor of everything from, you know, the Dashan to the common Doberman that we have today. So this is a, it's, it's an evolutionary process by removing what we don't want, right? And keeping and breeding the ones that we want. Now, this also happens with corn, right? Which is why when a lot of people say, hey, let's not genetically modify this. And you know, there's a lot of debate on it. But in truth, everything we ever we eat today is genetically modified to a certain extent. Because when a crop owner, maybe somewhere in the 1500s or the 1200s, you know, maybe he had this piece of crop and, and you know, maybe this piece of corn and he put it in, you know, he, he sowed it and, you know, the corn started growing. And, you know, maybe half the plane had like bad corn, the other half had, you know, good looking corn. Obviously, what he's going to do is take the good looking corn and sow that the next time. And he's going to continue doing that until the corn gets better and better and better. And as you can see, we just rejected the bad corn and we kept sowing the better and better corn until the best varieties were kept. And those farmers, you know, obviously gave it to their friends and other people because nobody wants to grow bad corn. And eventually we come to the modern variant of corn, right? So in this image, we actually see that the common ancestor for all corn that we have today and the, the good corn and the bad corn was something called teosint, right? And it's important for us to know all of these things because the same mechanisms that apply to this apply to us. The next thing is that you can actually see evolution in daily life, right? For those of you that are still like on the fence or not sure, you can actually see that in some places in the world, there are mosquitoes with DDT resistant alleles and alleles are, you know, you know, part of your genes that, that code specific features. So if you have a DDT spray and you go into, you know, a room full of mosquitoes with have both DDT resistant as well as non-resistant alleles and you spray this, then only the ones with resistant LLs will survive and only those will reproduce. And eventually you have a room full of mosquitoes that are resistant to DDT. This is the same problem with something called antibiotic resistance. And you've probably heard of this before. People ask you to finish your course of antibiotics. And the reason for this is because, say you have a little bit of bad bacteria and a little bit of good bacteria in your gut, right? In your stomach or in your body or wherever. And you take these antibiotics and you're wiping out all the bacteria both good and bad. Now see, there's a bunch of bacteria that's resistant to the antibiotic, right? That somehow survive, right? Because they have some specific property that, that, you know, prevents the antibiotic from entering their wall or whatever. There could be multiple ways they survive. Now what's more likely to happen is those bacteria are likely to continue reproducing. So the next time in a few weeks, once you stop the antibiotics, the bacteria that grow are the ones that had the resistant genes, right? So you basically made yourself immune to antibiotics. And the next time you have an infection, the antibiotics are not going to work on those particular type of bacteria, which is why you were asked to finish your antibiotic course. And if you're killing bacteria, completely kill them. So they don't have the time to adapt and reproduce. So natural selection is kind of you know, an extension of artificial selection. Artificial selection is something we found out. And then eventually this gentleman named Charles Darwin came and made this extraordinary claim that, look, nature has been breeding all of us, every species out there, right? Nature has been putting in artificial constraints and removing, you know, some parts of, of spe different species and making sure that only some parts survive, right? So it's been the breeder. Evolution interacts with itself in the sense that, you know, if nature makes sure that lions get stronger, then they will, you know, outcompete and kill all the zebras. So zebras would have been, you know, completely wiped out. If a certain species survives, it competes for the same resources that another species competes for. So in that, in either, you know, in a predator prey relationship or, you know, if it's rabbits and, and cows, they will both, you know, compete for the same amount of grassland. So one species is likely to survive if the other is a faster eater. So it really depends. It's a, it's, it's a, it's like a, like a crazy game that's going on. Um, the rules are very simple. They've been set for a long, long, long time. Um, the arena is the earth. 
and you know there's this wild competition that's going on and the fittest survive the fittest not in the sense as in the strongest or, or you know the ones that can run faster but the ones that are most adapted to their environment and all of the creatures on the planet including us including a chameleon have all evolved their own adaptations to play this game in the finest way possible for example there are giraffes with long necks that could reach trees for food and with us likely to not die of starvation Thus, giraffes with long necks were likely to pass on their traits, but this is specifically because their food was only available at heights. It's the interaction of the creature and its environment that matters, right? For example, if the trees were really short, then the giraffe would not be able to reach it because, or, or it would be very hard for the giraffe to reach it, and it's more likely that the rabbits would have outcompeted the giraffe, right? So it really depends on the environment, which is why certain species do very well in certain places, but they suffer in other places. A polar bear might be able to do really well in the Antarctic, but it would do really badly in our environment where the temperatures are very high and the coat of the polar bear would literally cause it to die of hyperthermia, which is high body temperature. Okay, so you have to understand and one of the, one of the you know, key proponents or one of the detractors of evolution, one of the main detractors is people will say, hey, so if we evolved from apes or we evolved from whatever, where are the missing spe species? Where are the, you know, the middle species, right? And the answer to this is very simple. All of us are evolving all the time. Every species, the minute it gives birth, it's evolving, right? It's, it's passing on some new traits. There are some mutations. Our definition of species is pretty much um, arbitrary, right? We, we look at different things and we say, okay, maybe the differences between this and its child are not enough for us to call these separate species. So we created a marker, right? We humans, we drew a line between all the species and we said okay this is one species this is another species and the lines we draw are when species are not able to reproduce with each other so it could be because they moved away from each other it could be because of physical barriers but when a species or when a creature is not able to reproduce with similar looking creatures we call it a different species right and it's an arbitrary cl classification and this number that i put there these two numbers 1% extinct and 90% 99% extinct means that all the living species we have in the world today are just 1% of all the species that have existed on earth because the other 99% are dead that they've not survived and here's a good example right let me just show you in the next one if, if you have this okapi and the okapi is considered somewhere midline between a giraffe and a zebra, right? Somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And we don't look at this because it's a rare creature. It doesn't, it doesn't survive so well because it doesn't have all the camouflage properties of a giraffe, sorry, of a zebra. And at the same time, it doesn't have the height and the ability to run as fast as a giraffe, right? So it doesn't, it, it's somewhere in the middle. It's not perfectly adapted to its environment. And, you know, obviously that's why it's a rare species. But think about this, right? If this okapi gave birth to another okapi that was purple in color because of some mutation, like I said, birth, like there are some random mutations that kick in, this creature would be dead, right? And the reason it would be dead is because of this, if there was a predator, this would be like, it's like a red alert, right? It's like you have this entire crowd and then you have one thing that with a red X painted on its back with a mark on its back. So this would be killed very easily because it's easy to spot by predators. It's easy to be killed. And that's the thing, right? Evolution is all about what adaptations you have res with respect to your environment. Because if the environment in a place was completely purple, right? If, if say, um, maybe it could be simply because, you know, the, of the interaction of the, of moonlight along with some rocks that made the entire environment purple in the night, then this creature would survive and the, these ones would die, right? So it really depends on the interaction between the environment and the creatures. If there were predators that could not see the color purple and, you know, there's a lot of the spectrum of light that we cannot see, for example. If there were predators that couldn't see purple, then this okapi would survive. So it really depends on the interaction, not just of that random mutation, but the interaction of that mutation with its environment, right? So, uh, and, and we still show signs of, of our early, early evolution, right? We, we show signs, human embryos as they grow, they have signs of the pharyngeal arc, which, is, which are gill-like structures, which are found even in fishes today. So it's just internal, it's, uh, you know, it happens when the embryo is growing, it differentiates into the neck and parts of the head in human beings. But the point is, it's of no real use. So like I said, bad adaptations lead to quick extinctions. Sometimes it could also lead to random stuff. 
for example, we adapted the ability to store fat, right? We adapted the ability or, you know, not just humans, but in the past, mammals adapted the ability to store excess nutrition, right? But that was an adaptation back then when food was hard to come by. Today, when food is easier to come by, you know, that adaptation is now actually a disadvantage, right? Because it leads to things like diabetes, obesity, hypercholesterolism. And, and all of this is because uh, it leads to, you know, excess cholesterol. And the reason is because we don't need that adaptation to our environment, which is abundant with food. In fact, in this environment, the creatures that would be most fit are the ones that actually don't absorb food or don't, don't store on fat. And that's the difference between somebody who's an ectomorph, who doesn't put on fat easily, and somebody who's, who's an endomorph, and somebody who's maybe a mesomorph, who, and somebody who's on the other end of the spectrum, who puts on fat very easily or who stores food very easily. So those are all adaptations. The person who puts on fat very easily would have survived in, in a spectacular fashion, maybe 2000 years in the past, but today that's kind of like a deterrent. Right. So all species are constantly evolving and bad adaptations lead to quick extinctions. Um, you know, one thing that we we still preserve from our very old days, from from our days as amphibians is our um, dive reflex. So this image here is actually one of dive reflex. You know, stop this video, open Google, look at dive reflex. It's an amazing relic that we carry on from our amphibian days. So when you take a human being and if you can put that human being's uh, nose and mouth inside cold water, specifically cold water, the dive reflex is activated. It's something that's very strong in aquatic animals. It's very strong in ducks, in birds. It slows down breathing rate. It slows down oxygenation. Um, it, it optimizes respiration to survive low oxygen environments, right? And we don't need this. Human beings don't need this. We will never use it, but it's still a relic from our amphibian days. And one of my major regrets in life is not learning the ability to swim, right? I feel like swimming is one of the best examples or the, the best ways to connect with our actual roots, right? Because when you're immersed in water, you are actually traveling back in time and activating the same reflexes that primitive creatures would activate, right? So it's it's something that I want to do in the future. It's, it's my next task. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to start learning how to swim uh, because I think, you know, connecting back to our roots, our real roots is important. So, Here's another example of natural selection that's happened recently. So in England, there were the peppered moths, right? So there was a light colored moth that was dominant and, you know, it was all over the place. And then when the industrial revolution happened and when coal burning started covering everything, so coal burning gave rise to soot and it started covering all the moths. And what started happening is when the, you know, the soot started covering the moths, the darker moths started surviving better right? Because they were pretty much hidden and you couldn't see a dark moth. You can't see a dark moth as easily as you can see a white moth. So the darker moths started having a survival advantage and it became the dominant variant. When England started cleaning its air, the survival balance tipped and the light one is now dominant. So this is an example of, of how evolution is not a permanent thing. It really depends on the environment. And because humans went out and cleaned the environment, we tipped the scales of evolution back in the favor of the white moths, right? So here are some examples of the near past, right? Which is, these are five skulls that are belonging to some ancestors and relatives of the modern humans. So as you can see, you have, you know, on the very left, you have Australopithecus africanus, which is very, very, very old. And then, you know, these are the intermediate species. Most of them are extinct because they weren't able to adapt to the environment. In fact, we, the human beings, we, we outcompeted all of them because of our ability to be social, right? because of our ability to team up with each other. And that's where I'm getting at with the entirety of this. The reason I started out with evolution for management is because we outcompeted all of our competitors because of our ability to form teams and come up with strategies, right? And we're gonna learn what those strategies and team building activities were. So natural selection designed our brains and behavior to deal with problems we faced in the plains of the savannas. Right? Just like hearts and kidneys and lungs, our brain and behavior has functional structure that has a genetic basis and therefore has evolved by natural selection. Understanding this survival and reproductive functions, these adaptations might have served over the course of history form the basis of evolutionary psychology. So how to infer another person's emotions, language, the importance of language and religion, discerning family from non-family, identifying and preferring healthier mates, 
cooperation and leadership, looking up to leaders, conflict, which is why should we fight and altruism, which is why should we give to other people for free or help other people like chimps. Humans form extended families, friendships and political friends and foes. And it's our job to learn about what happened in the past so we can better optimize our environment for today. So today there's a mismatch between the environment we evolved in and the environment we live in today. Right. So I gave you the example of diabetes where, you know, in the past it would have been an important adaptation. Today it's 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 a deterrent. It's a bad adaptation. Right. Today, almost everyone survives. Back in the day, you know, if you didn't have the right adaptation, 5,000, 10,000, couple of million years in the past, if you didn't have the right adaptation, you would die. Today, if you have the wrong adaptations, you will still survive, right? So trying to understand our specific adaptations and see why we do the things we do and why humans react in certain predictable ways is, you know, has been my journey in life, right? In the last 10 years, all I've done is studying things like code or, or, or um, design or product, I understand that at the end of the day, it's about helping humans connect and communicate with each other. And the more I learn and study about it, you know, in the beginning, when I started studying management, I thought that it was all about, you know, how do you manage other people, right? How do you make them work? Or how do you make them productive? But today, I understand that that's not the important bit. The important bit is understanding how humans interact with each other. What are the underlying currents of our interactions with each other? What do we want? Why do we manage people? Why, why do I, why am I even studying this or teaching you this? So understanding our behavior comes from really understanding wh what we evolved in the plains of the savannas. So marketing, sales, design, data science, finance, debt, depression, nutrition, the concept of money, product, they're all fundamentally studies of evolutionary psychology that are extended to different forms of technology, right? So we'll understand all of this. Um, and meta management is about the best way to manage people is to align their needs and evolutionary adaptations with their environment, which is you try and create an environment and set some rules on your office or, or the place that you work at so that we perform the best um, with each other, right? So you can rarely control a person, but in an office, you can control the environment and people's interactions with each other. And having, you know, interviewed more than two, 3000 people and having hired more than hundreds of people, I can pretty much vouch for the fact that this is true. And you have to go back to humans core needs. If you want to build something of value, you can't just treat them like, you know, like cogs in a machine. It, it doesn't work, right? So uh, this is the thesis of meta management. And we are going to learn how to manage people uh, on basis of evolutionary theory. So catch you on the next episode. Hope you're excited for the next one. Um, see you in a bit.